there is this um there is this attitude this this polarizing attitude towards death i find you know in this pandemic i suppose that happens in any pandemic but you have people who who say you know every life is sacred and you have other people who say no you know we just got to accept a certain amount of death and things happen but what's interesting is that the people that normally say one or the other swap places right so a lot of conservatives who normally say no life is sacred and we really need to protect life and abortion is terrible seem to be the ones who are saying, you know, just let people die. This happens all the time. Don't shut down your economy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's the progressives who are saying, you know, no, we got to preserve, you know, life. This is all special. So I, I'm kind of surprised by, by who has taken what attitude. But if you're an older person and we're getting there ourselves, you know, we we are becoming increasingly dis- disposable as far as society is concerned. You know, there's already some ageism and hiring. Now it's like uh, if you're over 65, you know, it's your time, man. Just take one for the team. You know, herd immunity and all that. You know, it's it's your time has come. So I don't know what to what to make of all this. <laughs> before before we came in, I was looking at what what I brought up on the screen here is. Uh, the deaths per million population. So this is, you know, where things are really, you know, uh, I think comparably bad around the world. And Sweden is being held up as a sort of, uh, you know, be, you know, an interesting case uh, because they are just uh, yeah, like very... the ad for the forehead, oh, forehead thermometer. thermometer. Yeah. Only seventy dollars. <laughs> Only sixty nine ninety five. Yeah, like that, that's let's, amazing. Let's buy one. That's awesome. Yeah, I haven't seen ads for um, for funeral <laughs> mortuaries just yet. <laughs> oh, and look at the top. UV yeah. light kills viruses and germs. Quickly That's sanitize exactly what I need anything. Right Everybody wants that now. Oh, now there's manscaping. Manscaped as well, so. and some manscaping. Oh, Jesus. Because, <laughs> you know, as you're going out, you want to make sure your, your man hairs are. Uh, well, it's not the hairs on your head. Appropriately, <laughs> appropriately groomed. Right. These are for. This so is below for the, the waist. Right. Yeah. Below the waist. And how to below. cleanse your liver. Oh, nice. Nice. Oh, Jesus. Well, how to cleanse your liver? That's what I'm interested in. <laughs> Boy, they. Oh I my God. How to cleanse they, my liver. Look at those. Look at that lovely liver. The right there. Oh, there's a beautiful liver there, and then there's the, an awful. The one on the left is it. not cleansed. No, but the <laughs> one on the right is shiny and beautiful. It's like one of those wooden bits you used to pull out of those giant constructive human things they used to have in classrooms. Oh, yeah, exactly. oh, you mean like the, the, the models of your internal organs? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They always, mm. they always used to gleam with this lovely sheen. And you think, oh, my insides are so nice and clean. It looks like you could use hang it on as together with little metal pegs. Uh, you <laughs> yes. Well, once your liver's been through that treatment, yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Just, oh, and a nice floral bandana, nice too. That's, that's yeah. so sweet. Yeah, you want to you look good, you know, despite what's happening. Want to go on, out in style? Of course, yeah. That's anyway. So I'm curious. I mean, I mean, morally, are, what do you guys think about the situation? Um, well, I mean, it's not really I, a moral uh, thing, though, is it? It's, it's. I mean, it's happening, and it's how we cope with it. And I, as far as I can tell, the most vulnerable are not being adequately protected, which is surely what this entire exercise is about. You know, we, sorry, the, uh, the you know, uh, care homes, <laughs> uh, care homes in, in the UK and uh, speaking and of the US, it's just it's 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 cutting through them like crazy. Well, yeah, I they tell can, you, they can get it too. It's we're going to we're going to get some we're going to try to get Toby in the next few weeks and it's not going to answer. And there's going to be a headline man eaten by cats and home or something, you know, yeah, basically the coronavirus <laughs> infected cats lose minds. That's right. <laughs> and eat man go on killing spree <laughs> <clears throat> well um, i yeah. uh the median age of the median age of death uh in british columbia the province i live in is 86 mm. um the uh the the uh there have there have been uh outbreaks in care homes obviously because they're like cruise ships but you wouldn't want to pay money for them um <laughs> The, the and worst kind of cruise ship. Cruise ships the worst cruise ever. To some awful place. It's the, it's the cruise and the entertainment. Like the entertainment sucks. <laughs> like 
Uh, um, it never like, ends. It's not it Disney. Never on, ends. It's not Disney on Ice. You know, um, it's sing, sing along with Patty. Um, um, but um, uh, and and I'm I'm being flipped, but I I say that as someone who's you know whose mom was in a care home with early onset Alzheimer's yeah, for 15 course. years. And uh, so, uh, so you're allowed to make I, jokes. I like I know- we can't make jokes, but you can make exactly. jokes. You have permission. you can make jokes. I don't fucking care. Don't you can fucking make jokes. Um, but I, I also feel like it's a world I know really well uh, and have spent a lot of time in. Mm-hmm. And for me, that's the story here. The story is about um, uh, the. Um, the choice we've made as a culture about what we do with our elderly people, mm. particularly in the context of a of a um, human lifespan in contemporary Western societies that has been extended by ten or fifteen years in the last generation or two, and all evidence that those last ten or fifteen years suck. Um, and us not having uh, a conversation about that. Mm. Um, that for me is the, is the, um, and, yes. and it's, it's it, about a week ago, I was going, I was going, oh, like, this is bullshit. Why is everybody pretending that all these people in nursing homes are living this fantastic life that is in danger? Why are they not talking about what that life lo- actually looks like? Because we're all headed there as well. Although that's shifted now, I think there's now a, in Canada anyway a bigger conversation starting to happen about um, the cultural phenomenon of of, of um, uh, assisted living and extended care for people eighty to one hundred, which is a you know a massively mushrooming portion of the population. Mm. Mm. Well, it's it's sort of that's like they just they've basically turned nursing homes into hospices because you know they knew that. Uh-huh that nursing homes were a hotspot and they've, and, and certainly in North America here in the U S they have asked many people in many States to shelter in place, but they haven't done anything about the nursing homes or assisted living facilities. So it's as if they've just left those people alone, knowing that that's a massive hotspot and therefore uh, leaving, you know, uh, encouraging them to die. So it's a very strange behavior. It seems. Uh, so assisted... yeah, in BC, in BC, we had a in, in Canada. It's like the, a bit like the states in that different provinces, like different states, behave a bit differently. Although it's more cohesive here, I think there's more of a national response. But uh, in BC, the, our our health, our public health officer did something really smart right at the very beginning, um, which she immediately banned uh, uh, caregivers from working in multiple. Uh, homes, which is how the industry works because oh. it's a low wage industry and it's contract yes, work. Yes, and so yes, yes. nobody wants yeah. to hire them full time because then they have to pay benefits. So she banned that. And then she made every single person working in a, uh, with the support of the government, made every single person working in a nursing home as a care aide, a public health worker. So she brought all those people into the public health system um, so that their good. wages went up. Yeah, their wages went up and they all had full time jobs suddenly. And so that cost a pile That's of money, but meant that it was contained, like that 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 there was a cohe. There was um, some of those problems mm-hmm. that have happened, at least in Canada, in other provinces, haven't happened here, um, and it hasn't spread in nursing homes massively here. Hmm. That's very so that's smart. A, yeah, so that's showing you know some care and consideration for the problem instead of leaving them hmm. to uh, fend for themselves, which they can't because they're in an assisted facility so that makes sense um and, and so, maybe spe- speaks to just to say one last thing speaks yeah. to because you started this david by talking about sweden and i think the sweden thing's really interesting because frankly i like i lean conservative in this in a response to this whole thing myself um in terms of uh protecting the specifically vulnerable but otherwise uh feeling like the shelter in place stuff which we're doing very stringently here i'm not so down with but um mm. The, the British Columbia public health response in nursing homes and then the whole Sweden thing, like one thing I read about the Sweden thing is that it's also um, being enabled in some way, and I don't know how true this is, but by kind of a, a general 
social trust in government um that there's a a, a deeper more uh that in the nordic countries the kind of like average citizens relationship to the idea of the public and and governance mm. is more tr uh, there's a deeper level of trust that enables the kind of laxer restrictions to to be effective i read something that said that mm. i guess what confuses me about sweden is because it, 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 my understanding is that in north america we would not not canada per se but in the u.s we did not have hospital capacity to allow the virus to just take its course. And so therefore, uh, we were instructed to shelter in place in order to minimize as much as possible the surge to the hospitals, right? So that's my understanding of why this, this decision was taken. And to extrapolate from that, that was a decision because there was no way to contain and manage the outbreak. In other words, we had an all or nothing solution. If we had a system of containment and testing and various other procedures that we could follow, then maybe we could have followed a different course. But since we don't have those things and we have limited hospital capacity, this decision was we have to do an all or nothing lockdown because we don't have other tools in our, to our, at our disposal. So that's sort of how it was expressed um, uh, to, to, to us, I think. And in Sweden, okay, they may have taken the position that they do have the hospital capacity. They're not going to be overwhelmed. They can allow the virus to move through the population. But I would have thought that even that said, they would tell the, the public, look, we should do a certain degree of social distancing because we don't want this thing to go through like wildfire. And we want people who are vulnerable to have an opportunity to protect themselves but it doesn't look like that's occurred there. It looks like they have literally just said it's business as usual. And so to me, that's what's a bit perplexing because you know, I think when it comes to these responses, a lot of these responses could be seen, could be um, evaluated in terms of historical behavior of influenza, let's say, where you know, we understand influenza, there's a certain number of people that die. But we're dealing with something we've never dealt with before. And so I almost feel as if going on past data and not erring on the side of a caution is a little bit um, irresponsible. Because what if this is a virus that doesn't leave your body like a herpes or something? Or what is it, you know, keeps reinfecting you? What if it has long term consequences in other ways that we don't know about? So just sort of saying, you know what, let's just let the population get it when we don't understand it strikes me as uh, not the best way forward. And already, you know, there are some strange symptoms showing up in the children in, in different countries like Australia and the UK and whatnot. And they're saying, this looks like Kawasaki syndrome, but not entirely. And is this COVID related? So already we're beginning to get an inkling that it's possible that COVID exposure um, encourages other bad things to happen. So with that, with that in mind, I don't know if uh, a laissez-faire attitude is wise until we have more information. Um, so, yeah. Kawasaki syndrome? What, that they're turning into motorbikes? <laughs> well, you know, this is the, I mean, it's the good news for the open motorway, but it's not so good news for... Uh, <laughs> Let's see if I can turn into a profitable, could turn profitable to a, Japanese. If I had to... <laughs> sorry, carry on. Oh, yeah, They're turning this into profitable this. Japanese corporations. Oh, yeah, that's that's yeah. It, it's a uh, strawberry tongue. Um, it's a disease oh, in which blood vessels throughout the body become inflamed. Um, oh my goodness! So you get. Uh, you get, um, let's see, fevers, large lymph nodes in the necks, rash in the genitals, red eyes, lips, palms, sores of the feet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so some children get coronary artery aneurysms from the heart. So that's not, not, that's not a particularly a good thing. So there you go. Anyway, um, but, but uh, yeah, so, so I think, you know, in terms of what they're doing, if they were kind of, you know, wearing masks and, I don't know when this photograph was taken. Maybe this is misleading. But if Sweden was sort of, you know, it's, where, it's, where, it's actually where, Burbank. It's actually California. <laughs> 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 yeah.
It very well could be. Oh, well, I anyway. Mean, uh, yeah. My friend who is, who is Swedish, who I, I speak to once a week on, on Wednesday nights, he said that basically they, anyone who can is doing what we're doing. Okay. Anyway, just without being told. And most Swedes That's the trust thing. Yeah. socially, yeah, most Swedes socially distance anyway. Um, hmm. So they, they <laughs> if there is, if there's a seat on a bus, apparently, and one of the seats is taken and the seat next to it is empty, no one ever sits there. So That's you will hilarious. always have two, a two seater to yourself. And so now that all that behavior is just getting further exacerbated and they're staying so don't, further so you don't, apart. But apparently so you don't have to do. pour a you don't have to pour a, a beer and put it near an empty chair just to keep the empty chair. I see. You, they just no, will no, respect no the empty chair on its own. In Sweden. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right. That's an interesting thing about all this too, is that all the cultural behaviors that I, I like um, in places like New York or London or Cairo or like wherever, where cultures are like all about like physical, I- intense physical presence are actually dangerous. And the cultures I don't like as much, Vancouver I would count as one of those where distance is kind of like the thing um, and being spread out and not getting too close are being rewarded, which I find sad. So Marcus, <laughs> are you saying that you like to be touched? <laughs> um, am I saying I like to be touched? Uh, well, it depends by who. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's not valid. like randomly by strangers, but I do like, uh, you know, I, I am a person who likes to be physical in my interaction. I don't like all this online communication. I much prefer being in person, yes. working in person. Uh, I feel like our bodies, you know, all that body kinesthetic stuff. Like I, that's very, re- I feel that's very real for me. Um, and I like, you know, I like Mediterranean cultures or big city cultures. Mm. For sure, mm. yeah. And I don't live in a big city. I live in a you know a medium sized city where that's very defined by kind of like waspy values. So uh-huh. that's a constant frustration of mine with where I live. Mm. <laughs> well, okay. And in the interest of kind of trying to pull some stuff together into a big pot, I I made a few topics for discussion. So the first one we just naturally went to, which was nursing homicide, um, and that's what we were. Uh, sort of disp- debating. I, 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 I also wrote down Tamagotchi because I was th- thinking in our social isolation that, that uh, it, it's not a, not a direct um, analogy, but I'm sort of feeling like, you know how that, that, that toy that came out many years ago where you had to keep this thing alive in this sort of virtual setting, otherwise it died and it would, it would you know, you'd have to throw the thing away. I sort of feel like we've become a bit like that because we don't know what everyone's doing at home, especially if you live alone. It's like you have to sort of call to keep uh, Nana uh, connected. Otherwise, she might uh, wither and perish. So I just put that out there and seeing what happens to us. Um, Well, that'd be good, though. If we had a little button that said, feed Nana. (laughs) <laughs> and then we had to push it every 12 hours. And that was at least it's better than what what some people do, which is just dump the elderly into homes. I know that's a, a cliche, but there are certainly mm-hmm. people who do that the second they become a burden. I know there are others where they can't manage it for whatever disease reason or for it. But there are a clump who just think, oh, she'll be she'll be well taken care of or he'll be well taken care of there. It's and a I don't I think I I spent years torturing myself trying to decide which one I was. Hmm. But that's the, this, the, the very fact that you were torturing yourself about it shows which one you were because these other yeah, people don't yes feel no. I don't know. Them. Maybe. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah. No, I think. Hard so. to know. Okay. You're awful, Marcus. That's, there you go. You're it's not awful. about me being awful. It's just, it's also, but it, but I think it's a great point. Like that you raise like that. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's a complex transaction. Uh, and, uh, where my experience of that experience is that you don't, it's not in inside your own head and heart. It's not clear. But you'll also see people. It's interesting who, uh, for moral reasons, don't want to put the elderly and their elderly relatives into a home and make things worse and struggle and make things worse and make exactly and make it worse because but they can't let go 
because they feel that exactly. would be a like failure. All those, but like, in fact, which which these homes are designed to care for people ostensibly with people with these conditions and illnesses, and you should sometimes let go. A absolutely, and how to navigate that territory is, I think, connected to what we're talking about in terms of nursing homicide and end of life and all those all those questions. I think I told David this story the last time we chatted, maybe, which is uh, that uh, I don't know what the laws are in the US and, and the UK now, but in Canada, assisted suicide is uh, medically assisted suicide is now legal. And we have an evolving culture yes. here in relationship. You have to have a terminal illness at the moment, although it looks like that'll even start to change. Um, and a, a neighborhood friend of ours uh, contracted bladder cancer, and uh, we got it. Did I tell you this story, David? Do you remember? No, no. Um, we, uh, I ran into a friend on the street, and they were like, "Oh, Cynthia," and we knew she was sick. That's all we knew. Uh, Cynthia is having a party uh, next week. Uh, you should come. And we we're like, "Okay, great." And blah, blah blah. And I emailed. I was like, and and the response I got to my email from the host of the party was, "Okay, yeah, Cynthia's going to come down at six thirty, but we're not sure if she, you know." How long she'll stay or whatever and i didn't quite get it and amanda and i went and it was our neighborhood community and some of my work community many complicated 30 year long relationships and everybody was being was full it was like 50 people or 60 or so even more 60 or 70 people and a few people we have long relationships with that were like you know like amanda and I immediately like why is everybody being such a fucking asshole like oh, i fucking hate this neighborhood blah, blah, blah. And then a friend of ours came up and went, wow, this is intense, eh? And we went, what do you mean? And they, we went, well, this is Cynthia's death party. And wow. Like, what? That's like such a bummer because you you, you, you the, the gift you got what for her is like a lifetime there? membership, yeah, exactly. you know, the lifetime membership yeah, is right. exactly. such and such and you'd give it to her and she's like, well, thank you, but, Ron's you know, I'm dying today. <laughs> But it was extraordinary. And, and, and the rest of the evening, once we figured out, we were like, oh, that's why everybody's being so weird, right? And then... And then Cynthia, and then we all gathered and Cynthia talked and uh, people sang some songs and whatever. And then, I, and it was extraordinarily beautiful. And she was totally mm. sentient. She's smoking cigarettes like crazy. She was about 75. Mm. Um, she was, had, and the next day she, um, uh, she killed herself at two. Mm. And, uh, wow. and what it, um, what it, and we were all like Amanda and I, and everybody was just like, but it was this incredible gift too. Because we had this like uh, experience we would not have imagined possible in terms of like proximity to someone else's, someone in our community's death. And then this community experience that's different than awake because she's there. And different also even than the wake that the pre-wake that like at some point they're gonna die in the future. This was like tomorrow at two. Anyway, I could just feel the the fact that these are going to become more did of a you, thing now and become actual. Party? Has, had it, was it said that it was, sorry, was it, was it clear that it was the next day that it was happening or did yeah, you find 2 that out subsequently? Yeah. No, we wow. knew, we all knew. And we all, Amanda, Cynthia used to come, we throw these dance parties every summer and Cynthia used to come and just dance and dance. Amanda and I danced at, at two o'clock uh, in the living room and uh, in fantastic. her honor. Um, yeah, like stuff like that. Like, and, and I can feel the window opening to a cultural shift, you know, in our very art, artsy, like progressive neighborhood, like for sure, but to a different relationship with end of life that eventually might preclude some of this nursing homicide uh, right. if, as it extends. Because my mom would have, had she been sentient, would have chosen not to spend 15 years lying comatose in a nursing home. She would have chosen to end her own life. Wow. Hmm. I think that's really timely because there are, um, uh, there's a well-known doctor and I'm blanking on his name is it Gupta or something who, who wrote a book about the subject recently, because, you know, if you have in, in the U S if you have, if you're wealthy, you can extend your life for a very long time in many cases, but the quality of your mm -hmm. life can be very poor. Mm -hmm. And if you keep providing funds to, hospitals, they consider it their um, goal to keep you alive, whatever the cost. Now, obviously, uh, you can have uh, you can have instructions as to what to do in certain intubation situations or whatever. But there are a lot of people for whom they, they do 
you know, spend as much as they can to prolong their life and the, their life can be quite miserable. And so it raises these questions of really at what cost um, do you want to remain alive? And at what cost, I mean, literally the cost, but also just in terms of human cost, what, what, what does it mean? And I think that we are increasingly going to have these questions because the technology available to us, uh, the length of uh, the lifespans that we have now from general health and whatnot. So, um, hmm. and sorry, I, <laughs> I had Disney on ice up there, which is probably inappropriate, but it's because you said it. And then I thought of ice being the immigration authorities here in the U.S. and how having oh, yeah, some right. kind of Disney show where they're chasing the immigrants <laughs> and all that could be kind of That'd cynically awesome. uh, amusing. So well, I apologize also, it, to that one. I'll put that one over here somewhere. But No, uh, no, it, it could it, also refer to Walt being frozen, of course. Ah, yes. Right. Yes. In right. fact, there was, a, um, there was some short sketch I wrote, which we never got to do with the video. But the idea was that um, people in the future... A video. They... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> very <laughs> world world famous brand. Um, uh, it is to me. <laughs> so, so the sketch was that uh, this this lab in the future, you know, discovers all these frozen people, and they think, oh, we can revive them and learn about the past. So they revive the first person, and all the person can do is draw a picture of a mouse and talk about talking animals and this and that, and they say. They put the guy back to sleep and say, oh, shoot, oh, this guy's Disney. loopy. Yeah, it's like clearly these people were mentally ill and they just froze them to keep their brains to, to try to understand their dementia. And so we shouldn't revive them. It's just cruel. But yes, of course, it was Walt. Um, so had they known. That's right. This is to close the door. Ah, yes, please. I mean, the, the sound of the birds out there is just, uh, it's making me feel so lonely. <laughs> That sounds like a beautiful party, and and if people can take control like that, I suppose you know if you are someone that feels strongly enough about it, you can turn it into a celebration. Sorry. Mm. Um, a few other kind of things to throw out there. Contact tracing is a kind of interesting word, which you know has come up a lot in the um, in the news. And then the other one I wanted to sort of add to the mix was astroturfing, which. Uh, I added that word because I was really fascinated by how um, propaganda is being um, propagated, not from the top down like it used to be, but from the bottom up. So I tried to coin the term grassroots propaganda, and then I learned that actually there is such a word already, and it's astroturfing, and apparently it's the practice of masking the sponsors of a message or organization. So. Mm. You hide who is really sending out the message and you make it look like it's coming from the grassroots. So I, mm. I love that because to me, that is really mm. happening a lot lately um, when you see these sort of spontaneous eruptions of some kind in the public with a, with a uh, demonstration or something like this. And then you find, oh yeah, there's all these kind of interesting shadowy sub suspects um, pulling the strings behind it all. So I feel like social media is also one giant astroturf machine because, you know, <laughs> you think it's coming from friends of yours, but it's, you know, coming from all sorts of different places that have hidden agendas. So, Absolutely. yeah. So I, I don't know. I throw that out there for discussion. And what I was hoping to do, if at all possible, was turn these things into what we often using our story stuff as an issue and the issue are sort of what if questions that we create and we're calling this like an issue jam and uh to give you a sense of what i mean you know here are some what if questions that we've created in the past um what if social media was a form of social engineering now that goes quite nicely with astroturfing actually so so that's uh something to to contemplate um another one that we had was um what if uh, you could have personally tailored dreams? So we're just trying to think of what if questions that arise as we discuss some of these things. And um, you've already, I think, come up with one, which is, you know, something to do with what if you could pick the day you die. So I'm going to add that as a what if question. What if you 
could pick the day you die. All right, so that's that's one I think that came out of this today. Yeah, does, this, does this word contact tracing, I mean, we know how it's being used in this context, but did, did this word ever appear before now, as to your knowledge? Have you ever heard it before? To, and to I, me, think, it's, I think yeah. it's... Oh, I was just going to th- say that it it's very... In- I mean, uh, I'm working in the very early stages of working on a project that... Um, is kind of about all the data surveillance stuff. Um, and um, the contract tracing and its relationship to COVID to me is super provocative and interesting uh, in relationship to the, the, the migration of our uh, selves online and its relationship to technology and capitalism, because it feels like this the understandable impulse and seeming like from what I read, like usefulness of like the contract tracing methodology, its relationship to uh, data harvesting and, um, and corporate control um, is pretty explicit. Um, And so um, I find that like this feels like a you know one of those like i don't know if you know naomi klein and disaster capitalism and like those kinds of things but a potential kind of inflection point uh around um uh, uh, the utility of this technology and its relationship to capitalism and commerce well i think i i'm going to add to that because we're using it in the context of uh, a pandemic, which is a you know a physical virus, but I think the idea that ideas can be viruses and that contact tracing in terms mm-hmm. of who have you influenced, who mm-hmm. have you come in mm-hmm. contact with, who have you spread your propaganda to, is also you know where these things can go because once we put the apparatus mm-hmm. in place and we accept the use of it, now it can be used for other purposes, right? So the idea, yeah, of, I mean, if you look yeah. at if you look at Shoshana Zuboff's book, the big one that I loved, Age of Surveillance Capitalism, like it's already happening. Like it's not, the, it's not an if, it's like as. What sort of, um, yeah, what I, I've, I've got that on my reading list, but I haven't read it yet. So what, um, what did you glean from that uh, book? Well, it's pretty comprehensive and it's like 15 years of research. Um, so I can't properly uh, kind of summarize it, but um, uh, uh her her basic kind of thesis and for me fairly well supported you know as a complete lay person reading the material uh is that um uh the um incremental um kind of colonization of like every aspect of our interactions this being one that we're doing right now in which Vimeo is gathering the data and, you know, not in a sinister way, like they don't give a fuck who we are, but just in purely behavioral ways and now through cameras and now facial, you know, and the facial recognition stuff that the, that it's not that that's inherently bad. It's, it's intersection with capitalism because the monetization of that, like what corporations want most is uh, to be able to predict behavior because that's what allows them to monetize their products most effectively. Like it's just capitalism. It's not a, it's not a mystery. It's not a conspiracy. Um, and the monetization of our social relationships and our human, our internal um, uh, psychic and psychological experiences um, allows corporations to, um, uh, to predict behavior in a much more uh, granular sort of way which allows them to tailor um, their uh, product. Um, and this isn't ads that you see, like there's, that's the like, this is in terms of herd behavior in a certain kind of way. And I can't make the leap into how this occurs right now in this mm-hmm. moment, but it's in the book, like that essentially um, uh, it's already beginning to modify our behavior in the way that you're talking about mm-hmm. idea views. Um, And I mean, a really clear example of that is like the function of rage on Twitter, like that Twitter, that rage, anger and rage, outrage 
produces more revenue for Twitter. Right. Because the angrier we are, the more we retweet. And it's attention economy. And it is factually the clicks that are the, like the amount of attention mm -hmm. that actually produces revenue, like literally. Yeah. So we have become the natural resource. We are the most, our, uh, our, our, our actions yes. are the most yeah, valuable resource there. Is. Like we are, we are not the customer. We are the product. Uh, that thing. Exactly. So I love the attention economy. So I came up with a couple of what ifs when you, uh, as you said that, um, one, these, these are very poorly written, but maybe you get the ideas, but basically, you know, what if you could get paid for astroturfing? So in other words, you, there's, there's some kind of affiliate marketing benefit. If you can spread, uh, the, the, the idea virus in some way you get, you get paid for, for it. So it's getting paid well, for propaganda. Don't you, so. in a, in, don't you already in a way with like likes, like if I tweet something and, and, and I get a bunch of retweets and re likes and likes, mm -hmm. like, and I'm seeking social media influence that will like, you kind of do, don't you already? I guess. But what if you could match advertisers who want to encourage that kind of behavior. So when somebody uh, places those, those, an idea or a meme, do, they, are, get, they get, go ahead. But those are influencers. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. selling a lifestyle. And as, as well as that, they're selling ideas about how you achieve that lifestyle, which are fake for the most part. I mean, it's only a small so, step there from memes, from memes to, I mean, I think a meme is what we're talking about, right? It's a, a, yeah. an idea or concept Andy. that you virally transmit. Mm. So I'm thinking of what if social media influ influencers become, um, let's see, because they're, they're sort of, they, people think of them as important to popular culture, but what if they become important to, I guess, political culture or... All right, well, what, uh, what if a live streamer became president? Mm. Well, I mean, so the camera is falling on twenty four like, hours a day. Yes, it is. But let's let's, let's just do a little, like, little thing: live streaming twenty four hours a day and making decisions on the fly from the input that's coming in. No, I mean it's exactly what he is. But let's let's push that into further hyper reality mm. and say it's some idiot. Oh no, that's reality. Let's say it's some live streaming young fool who gets in and suddenly every decision he makes is influenced by the votes online or the anger online or which again is unfortunately true oops so they're sort of basically deciding via the polls all the time uh yeah and i think i sorry i think there's there's a distinction to be made or 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 also like in relationship to that i notion like around like the division between politics and the economy because because mm -hmm. There, there isn't really a distinction, right? Like that, 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 mm -hmm. that, that those two things are so deeply embedded that the influencer, the current influencer, so not the, the exaggerated version, but the current influencer mm -hmm. who is, um, it, you know, and this, this is, this is how it works. Like the Instagram influencer who's like, you know, doing things, whether at a low le micro level or it's fucking Beyonce or whatever, mm -hmm. like, on either level is selling like is is deeply embedded in the, the 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 economic system and what they're doing is primarily economic but that is political like that is ideological yeah. like that is that is capitalism uh preaching uh its uh value um which is the moment we're in too right like where the economy like what's the that the economy is the thing um that's a both true in one way, but also an ideological po and political position in another. Well, I mean, I, 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 so that is loaded because I was thinking about how right now there's this equivalency or tension being made in, in the U.S. between uh, public health, public safety, and the economy, as if these things are mm -hmm. in uh, antipathy to one another. And so mm -hmm. some people have tried to make the argument that, no, these things are not in antipathy to each other because ultimately the economy depends on public health. That's one argument. But I, I think another argument is that there is a subtle sleight of hand going on where people want you to believe that the economy is the stock market, the public markets, and it's mm -hmm. the health mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. public corporations. 
that to me is another mm -hmm. is a very clever shift of framing mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that isn't the economy the economy are clearly people people that consume and produce mm -hmm. and so if you looked at the economy as your citizens spending money and making money as opposed to your elite corporations and uh, your public markets, which very few of the actual public are invested in, then you would take a very different decision about things, right? If, if mm -hmm. you conceived of that as the economy, then you would say, ah, public health is quite important because you know, we need to make sure that these people won't uh, contract their consumption or change their habits in any ways that, that destroys the, the economy in general. But instead, you have this framing that the economy is the public markets and those those large corporations and therefore the lion's share of the bailouts are going to those entities and not to the real economy which is the people that support everyday life so i find that kind of fascinating because it's a false equivalency that's being created by a reframing and they're trying to get the general public to accept that the public markets are the economy when that's that's clearly not the case and a, and a corollary maybe distinction too is that in relationship to the influencer stuff and kind of what Toby raised in terms of like the the this is my Kardashians like, in the White House. There we go. That's a Car the Kardashians, no, like Kardashians White House edition. White House. Yeah. And and related to that is there's also I think a perception, um, an ideological idea or perception that uh, the economy of like. I'm Kim Kardashian and these are the clothes I'm wearing and you're going to go buy the winner's knockoff version of these clothes is a more real sort of economy, the consumer economy, than the economy that is the low wage caregiver working in the nursing home, caring hmm. for an elderly person, that that is not the economy in the same way. And yet, in the terms you set up, David, they, hmm. those are those are those are both uh, and which is productive and which is not, which is profitable, which is not, um, is an interesting question because ultimately they're all people doing things, doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I have an attitude on which is more valuable, but, but that doesn't, I, I don't have to put my own moral, you know, a value judgment on it. It's just I can say that across the board, the real economy, as far as I can tell, is people spending and making stuff, and that that is it, that it comes from sheer volume. That when you have uh, all these people doing those activities, they are contributing to the economy. Whereas when you are talking about people that uh, that extract. Uh, value from the economy and don't put it back in. Well, those people are not part of. They're not part of the real economy because they're doing an extraction, rent-seeking activity, which is totally different. So, right. so for example, when we talk about large corporations, I think they're very interesting because right now there's this all this emphasis put on helping them and saving them. But you know, we know for many for many decades now that what large corporations tend to do is they act like multinationals that have no particular allegiance to their home well, country, yeah. let's say. And so, you know, they'll take money out of the economy, they'll s offshore it somewhere else, they'll, they'll, they'll send work elsewhere, they'll do whatever they can to really or not buy back, money the, back. buy back their own shares. They, they buy, buy back their, their own, own shares. shares. I mean, that's what they which, do with which bail, helps, bailout yeah. money. Well, yeah, and it helps shareholders, but the shareholders are not necessarily spread, distributed well throughout the real economy either. So, <laughs> so it's a, it's a, the whole thing is a fallacy, um, but it's a fallacy that's being pushed on us through astroturfing and other wonderful methods. Um, I can see that we're getting one point. One, yeah, go ahead. One quick point of information. Mm. Just this is, and not to do the Trump in Canada thing, which is you know, but it's been interesting because in this COVID crisis, Canada has responded differently than it ever has before, and the vast majority of the money that is being spent is being sent directly to individuals. That is unprecedented. That has never happened before, um, and That's there's been right. very little blowback. Um, which is, which is very strange. So basically, everybody in Canada is getting two thousand dollars a month right now. It's essentially UBI, but it's yeah, temporary. That's great. That's a great. Well, no, but weird. it makes but it makes sense because I think that when you take trillions of dollars as we have in the U.S., if you were to give those trillions of dollars to individuals, 
then you would be supporting the real economy. But if you give the trillions of dollars to corporations and things, you're not supporting the real economy. So that's that's kind of the point that I was making. So I think UBI is fascinating. And um, it, I've listened to a lot of argument around it. And generally, I'm in favor of it. I think it's a really interesting idea. But I think that that said, it's still kind of a Band-Aid for systemic problems that that you may have in the distribution of wealth. And so you, you create totally. that as a band-aid and, you know, it's, it'd, be be it'd be better not to use UBI as the mechanism, but in the absence of anything else, it may be all we have to try to distribute wealth more evenly. Um, the bigger problem, and this could be a whole nother jam for the future. The bigger problem I think is just what we value, what, what we put a valuation on things. And we tend to use price as a valuation metric and that gets us mm -hmm. into all sorts of trouble. So if we, put value and uh, we measure different things, measured value in different ways, we would have a different society. So um, I, I um, wanted to kind of get back to some of these what if questions. This one is a kind of a, maybe a silly one, but it's sort of what if your death party really sucks because you yeah, described a, a really, you just, you just, you described a beautiful one and not, not always wanting to kind of find the humor in the tragedy. Um, you know, <laughs> I was thinking, you know, you, you hold a death party. Maybe you don't tell everybody right away that it is a death party. Like you were saying, you went to this yeah, unwittingly. And, and so the, the yeah. person doesn't really want to cast a poll. So they basically invite people to a party, which is their death party, but the party really sucks. And now they don't know if they tell everybody they're gonna, you yeah, know, feel good. bad or or whatever. So it's <laughs> funny. Um, so now I'm also um, so I'm also gonna add uh, based on something that Toby said. What if Nana was Tamagotchi? Because then then that's almost like you make a game. You gamify nursing homes, right? Uh, so what sort of what if uh, nursing homes? the game, I guess. Uh, so that's not very well written, but the idea is that uh, no. to, 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 to increase people's engagement <laughs> with nursing homes, you turn it into a game and people are trying to keep the nursing home residents alive Great idea. Uh, using the sort of Tamagotchi interface, you know? I think um, the title could be Nan Nana Tamagotchi. I think that's not a bad title. <laughs> okay. um, Nana Tamagotchi. Um, just a heads up that I have a, a, a 930 Zoom and I'm going to take yeah. a few minutes between Zooms because I've, I've learned not to just go from one to the other um, screen eyes okay. wise. So I'm going to I'm going to probably sign off in like 10 or so minutes. Well, I think yeah. we're I think we're getting to the end. This is good. I think what what my my hope was, was that we could come up with some what if questions that would be useful in the future. I might rework yeah, some of fun. the wording, but I think these ones are you know kind of nice. We have. We have, what if your death party really sucks? We have, um, what if your leader live streams their life and decides everything via polls? Uh, what if Nana was Tamagotchi? What if nursing homes were the games? We've got Nana Tamagotchi. We have, what if social media influencers become leaders? That's part of the other one. That's kind of uh, like the live streamy one, right? Yeah. Mm. What if you could pick the way, the day you die? Uh, what if you could get paid for astroturfing? I have to rework some of the wordings. And what if you get paid for propaganda, which you say is already happening? So I think we've got a, a, some some good ones in there. And then, of course, there's Disney on ice or ice on Disney or ice on ice, um, which uh, I can sort of already see in my head. So that's always a feels bad like sign. A, it feels like in in like the world of like the Gil, uh, Gilliam's Brazil movie, like uh, <laughs> d d the Disney ice enforcers. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so i this is kind of a very generic one but it's what if ideas are dangerous and i bring that up as this idea virus and contact tracing i feel like there's a what if there that can be crafted and i'll have to think about that after this uh after well, the this idea meetup. that you'd have to be put into an idea quarantine oh yes mm, that's good that's good that's really good uh, idea quarantine. I so love it. You're, you're, so you won't be polluting other people with these ideas you have. Is it like, no. I suddenly had, it's probably stupid, but I had this image of like, also like a physical intervention, like for the idea quarantine that somehow there's like, there's a, a needle that can like, that can like quarantine the idea somehow, like in your, in your brain, oh, yeah. or, like that it's, oh, 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 it has oh, a physical good. manifestation as well. 
Yes. Oh, that's really it's not just good. about isolating the person. It's about like that's really good. It's well, not controlling. They, I mean, yeah, okay, oh, okay, but hang on, wait. But isn't yeah, that yeah. now we're getting into? Uh, can you be inoculated against certain ideas? Mm. Right, right. Is there a vaccine? Is there a vaccine mm. to wanting freedom? And is and can you tr can you trace the idea through antibodies? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, can you? Mm -hmm. Because now they're trying to develop the antibody test to see if people have been exposed. Can you tell oh, them right. an oh, antibody yes. test to see if they've been exposed to the idea? So yeah. uh, I'm going to make an So this is you wouldn't I, want to say, right? Like you wouldn't be like, yeah, I, I had yeah. the idea. No. <laughs> so, maybe you don't yeah. even know you have. Maybe you don't know you have the, you had the idea. Do you know what this I mean? Is, maybe it's in you, but you yeah. don't show the symptom. It's an idea it's antigen. You've been. Or you have the potential. You are susceptible to it. <laughs> That's you've been so exposed. Good. You've I been exposed it. to the. So you have the idea antigen test. You've been exposed to the idea, and yes, you have to establish whether you have um, a, a dangerous exposure. Whether this is a dangerous exposure, whether it's taken root in your system or not. I was going to say that unfortunately, this this. What if you have to be put into idea quarantine? This is unfortunately a reality. Um, in in China, uh, the government periodically disappears people that are saying things yeah. publicly that they're not supposed to. And uh, so, you know, this has happened with uh, celebrities and professors and various things. They'll disappear sometimes for a couple of years even, and then they'll reappear. And it turns out they've been kept in some resort hotel against their yes. will, you know, with a couple of minders for like, you know, months or years in an effort to convince them that they really shouldn't say or do those things which is which is which is brave new world that's brave new world i mean that's what happens that's the exile for the resisting intellectuals bernard marx has offered it um but refuses it because he's a ambitious and a toady um but they go to iceland it's not a resort but it's actually really fun there because it's a bunch of really smart people like but they have no impact on society well i have the answer uh you just put them in a nursing home and uh, that takes care of them. <laughs> so the, yeah. the Tamagotchi the game. Yeah, well, Tamagotchi game determines like whether other people think that you should be kept alive. Otherwise, you're going to just die in the nursing home. That's where you go when you have bad ideas or ideas that are dangerous to society. Um, I have a protocol question. Hmm. Like, this jam is really great. Like, it's really awesome. This whole like idea quarantine, idea antigen, like mm. a, a notion is fucking fantastic. I'm curious because I am working on a number of things like, like what's the kind of protocol in terms of using ideas that we jam? Like, how does that work? Um, Cause I wouldn't want to use something like the idea of an idea antigen or something without in a in a in a subterfuge way or, or but at the same time i go oh that's a really fucking good idea like yeah what's well the, what's the well, protocol no that's a good question and i think that um you know there's there's my personal view and then there's i guess the legal view the legal view is that this is all fair game these are not uh copyrightable these are just ideas right so it's not something that you can copyright until you've actually expressed it as a written work in, in more detail so and my attitude is a little more broad than that. I always feel like ideas are free because if you are creative, right. you'll have lots of ideas and there really isn't any reason to, to, to I feel the same way. I just want to make sure like, cause yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and so, so what I've been doing with Toby is, is that, um, we've been, uh, using an approach of sorts that I'm, that I'm noodling, I'm working on. And the idea is to sort of come up with these pitches that are, um, to a certain degree, fairly generic so that they don't feel that proprietary. Then they pass a certain point where they start to feel more proprietary. Become, so, yeah, yeah. so there's a lot of work that we sort of do up front and then I post online, which to my, in my mind is non-proprietary. They're just, uh, you know, kind of fun discussions that, that find connections between things and we connect the dots and we come up with, uh, you know, interesting material for pitches, but it isn't really until you've put together a very detailed pitch that I think it starts to become kind of proprietary okay. territory. Um, but also that's a good segue to briefly, and I know you have to go, but to say that, you know, one of the things that I've been trying to square away is how do we do, how do we deal with this when we start doing more detailed uh, pitches and we're working with a variety of people? So 
my attitude is you could either work under existing agreements and things uh, with those people and you can have your own agreements. But I've set up this cooperative in the UK to try to address that problem, which is to say that if, if someone is, is happy to take the intellectual property they're creating into the cooperative, then they will have some control over it, but it is there for the cooperative. And then any of the ideas that people sort of come up with in the cooperative are fair game and they all stand to benefit. So they'll benefit from commercializations of things that they themselves have created, but they also indirectly benefit from the commercializations of everything. So it's kind of a way to remove some of those uh, disincentives to keep things private or or not to share and not to not to mentor or help out other people. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll happily share more information about that in the future. But that's sort of my, my answer. It's kind of like taking open source and saying, let's take all the benefits of open source, but let's, let's allow for monetization, which open source doesn't. Let's allow for commercialization. Yeah. It's interesting, David, because that in many, many ways is the principle. So I, I co-founded kind of an art center here in Vancouver, and it was four companies, uh, theater companies that came together. Um, we were all, we'd all been hanging out we're all the same age and this was now 15 years ago and we're struggling for space and blah 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 and we came together and decided to pool our resources and formed a network called progress lab that has now become an art center it's a you know it's not huge but it's like a 10,000 square foot art center with a big studio and offices and blah 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 and all those things mm -hmm. and the principle we kind of used um we're not an officially a co-op um we're a non -pro we formed a non-profit society that's an umbrella society that we all sit on the board of mm -hmm. But the principle that we used was kind of fundamentally the same. It was a co-op principle, which was like at, at its heart was like, if people are transparent and behave ethic and try to behave as ethically as they can, that something good happening out of what is generated here for one of the companies is actually good for everybody. Right. And that, and that I, I, and I think that, be yeah, I think you're, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, business entities that try to, equitably distribute um, financial benefits and other things that come. So, so to and, me- And also share out, resources, right? Right, yeah. So, 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 so we formed, uh, so there is a cooperative, a legal cooperative that we formed in the UK. And the next step is to create the membership agreements and the membership agreements would determine what is fair game, right? So, so my answer yeah. is a deft, a deft sidestep to say, well, I don't know what fair game is because that has to be determined by all the members in the membership yeah. agreement. So whatever the members think is fair game of fair use is what is, is what is done. And the cooperative just al allows for a democratic mechanism to, for decision making and yeah. to, to establish that uh, if there are investors, they don't have any priority in, in uh, financial outcomes. They don't have any say in the management. So it's a, you know, kept very separate. Uh, and so you don't have shareholder problems like you would have in, in uh, corporations, uh, uh, non-cooperative corporations. Um, so two things, because I do have to go. Um, mm -hmm. One, like, I love this jam. I would do this again in a couple of weeks if you guys wanted to. Great. This is super fun. Great. And I yes, love these please. ideas. Please. <laughs> these are great ideas. Um, and two, kind of practically, like if, um, because I am writing something in particular that I'm thinking about, if I do end up kind of co-opting a phrase or something, I will let you guys know. And you yeah, guys, I mean, these, this it, project I mean, I'm look, particularly the, the, thinking about. The yeah, my, my... Is if we're helping you, that's the joy. Of Great. It. Yeah. And also keep us uh, abreast to share stuff with us. Um, because, you know, what we're trying to do is encourage Feel other people to, to do the same. As a, as, a, as a bouncing board, if you, for ideas or stuff. Great. That's no, kind awesome. of that's, well, that's really what this, this whole co-op is, is meant to be. It's meant to be uh, an idea where the more creative people you put in a room, the better the ideas are that are going to bounce back at you. Yeah, which was my experience here in that, that jam. That was fun. Like there's two or three Good. like really solid. Good. I'm not going to run away and write them all. I don't mean that. But just two or three solid things that we could, <laughs> we could, wor we could work on. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad that you enjoyed it, and I would definitely we, let's let's have let's have everyone together again on uh, the near future. So do, yeah. please, please, so, this was lovely. So I, I want to say thank you, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll sign off thank with you. everyone, and uh, have thank a great uh, rest of the week, and hope yeah, and to I see you all soon. Of, like, 
a couple of weeks I would do just to put okay. that out there. Fantastic. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, okay. Marcus. All right. Thanks, you guys. Done. Thank you. Have a so, good Zoom, bye. sir. It was lovely to see you. Oh, bye. yeah. It's not a good one. But anyway.